will feel for my Lord. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. And I promised him that I would serve him till I die. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. Amen. 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 And the reason um, I'm singing that is because it's a battle cry. We're going to have a family conversation today. We're going to talk about some stuff. If I can put the bottle down. We're going to talk about what it is God has called us to as the body of Christ. For the scripture says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Then he goes on to say to all of us, therefore, my brothers and sisters, because Christ calls us his brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This is the word of God. Thanks be to him. So that battle cry stems from the theme of this message called Why We Can't Wait. Dr. King says, Reverend King says, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. We are tied in a single garment of destiny because whatever affects one of us directly affects all of us indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow, provincial, outside agitators' ideas. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider. Now, these words were penned in what was famously referred to as the letter from a Birmingham jail. On April 16, 1963, Dr. King addressed this correspondence to eight white pastors, and it begins, my fellow clergymen. That's important because most of the talking he was doing was to the nation and to politicians and to presidents and to places around the world. But now he's talking to his people. He's talking to his brothers and sisters in Christ. Each had written back to him to chide him for coming to Birmingham. That's why you were in jail. Why, did you, why didn't you stay in Atlanta? His answer to them was, because we can't wait. Because they wanted him to wait until after the election that would have dethroned the reign of terror to Sheriff Bull Connor, who was notorious for his unsympathetic harassment of minorities. If you see any of the black and white pictures of people who got hosed and the dogs were sicked on, that was Bull Connor. But Dr. King said, no, we can't wait. Because if anybody ought to understand this, it should be you, my brothers and sisters. As a matter of fact, you should be in here with me. Because we are joined by a different call. We are joined by a different blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. Reverend King, their brother in the Lord, thought it was so important to communicate to them that he sought scraps of paper. There wasn't paper there, but he found newspapers. And if you see the original letter, it's written on the side of newspapers or scraps of paper because he felt like, I'm going to answer my brothers finally because I'm sitting here in jail and they are the ones criticizing me. And in that letter, he exclaimed, the reason I'm in Birmingham is because I'm not waiting anymore. The church shouldn't nor should we ask the church, or nor should you ask me to wait. You see, all of these men, including Reverend King, were educated in the same sort of seminaries and were taught the same word of God. They had this in common. Because after all, the scripture says, if any man is a Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are new. He also goes on to say in Galatians that for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 
There is neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Jesus. Now, if anybody should have known that, it should have been pastors. But we're not here just to talk about Dr. King because he was born on this day. I think God rose him up for such a time as that because this is the Lord's day. So we're going to hear from what Jesus said and what he inspired Dr. King to say. In the past few Sundays, we've been talking about hope. Right now in this country, I don't know about you, but I need some hope. <laughs> but I know where to get it from. It comes from the word of God. It comes from you. So the past weeks we've talked about the hope of a new beginning, about starting a new, New Year's resolutions. I saw on last Sunday, I've never seen that many people at the nine o'clock service and at this service. I mean, it was wall to wall people because the resolution I bet you was, I'm gonna go to church this year. <laughs> we'll see what happens by April. <laughs> hope you're still here. Then we talked about the hope of the epiphany about God revealing himself to us that he has shown us who he is and through him, we know who we are. So there's no reason for us to be afraid of anything. And today we're gonna to talk about the hope of the church, the chance to re-engage in the redemptive work of the church now because we can't wait. Our pastor Dan Meyer often talks about being a firstborn. Well, I am too. And when it comes to be in the firstborn, I don't know about you guys, but I come with a whole set of issues because I'm the firstborn. You know, I kind of run it. That's, that's what we do. If you ask my siblings, they'll tell you I got issues. If you ask my parents, they'll tell you I got issues, and I'll tell you I got the issues from them. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're the firstborn, you kind of run it. You know, you kind of have the space all to yourself. You are, you are the darling of everybody's eye. Your aunties yell at your mother for yelling at you. And you know, she's, oh, she's so cute. Oh, but when the baby comes, the next baby comes, the strange things happens. Now I'm a nine-year-old little girl and I'm about to get my first sibling. Amidst the anticipation and curiosity, there was this momentary feeling of displacement. She don't run it no more. <laughs> It's not all mine anymore. I didn't get as far as the jealousy because the fascination of watching that little fat chubby baby was wonderful for me. And I started to become protective, nurturing. Matter of fact, when I was a teenager, they were little and I would go places and they would accidentally call me mama and that did not work to date a boy. <laughs> no, th these are not my children. These are, these are my, they're my siblings. But I became nurturing and caring and responsible, and loving toward this kid and then the other kids who came. And then we started to share a room and it was no longer my stuff, but it was our stuff. It was no longer my house, but it was our house. That is not unlike what happens to us in the body of Christ or what should happen. That means friends that unlike Cain, who said to God when he asked, where's your brother? I'm not my brother's keeper. We are our brother's keeper. Scripture tells us that we ought to look upon others as better than ourselves even, that we are to feed and clothe and protect our siblings, our brothers and sisters in Christ and those outside of the body as well. This redemptive work of sheltering and protecting others is so important to God that in Matthew 25, he says the following. It's a long passage, but it's good. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then this king, our God, will say to those on the right, come, you who are blessed of my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we do this? 
When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I say to you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Now that's not just to the outside church folks, that's to us. Charity begins at home. That's what I learned as a kid. If you don't know how to treat your people, how are you going to treat other people? So through our salvation as Christians, and though it's a gift from God, God's expectation is that we do what he tells us to do. I don't know about you, but I remember being a child and being told what to do. And I want to imagine that we are all in the room together as God's kids and sisters and brothers. And Jesus has told us, I want you to do this. Terry, I want you to wash those dishes. Terry, I want you to wash those clothes. Pete, I want you to take care of the junior high. And we say no. When I was a kid, my mother had a way with a house shoe. And if I felt like, if she felt like I was looking at her the wrong way. <laughs> and some people are shaking their heads because they know that thing. It was a soft house, you guys. I would feel that thing on the back of my neck and go, oh. and see, these people know because we live this thing. This may be a cultural thing. I don't know about you. But it, it is something. But you got up and you did what you were told. And if you were smart, you kept doing what you were told. Is that not unlike us as believers? Does God not have to take a house shoe to the back of our head sometime to get us to do right? And then when we get it, when you get in the rhythm, you see his blessing. Not, we don't do it because we're blessed. We do it because we're grateful, because of that grace and mercy that they sang about earlier. So that means that I need to concern myself with the needs of other people. That means that I need to practice sacrificial giving of resources instead of my own wishes. That means that I need to lay down my life for my brothers and sisters. And I can tell you, there are not too many people I'm gonna stand in front of a bus for. But Jesus says, these are your family. And I do it for my child, I do it for my daughter. I need to know, I need to feel as though I will do it for you. That we be good Samaritans and not just meet the immediate need, but the future needs of our brothers and sisters. When we talk about the good Samaritan, the good Samaritan took this guy to the inn and he paid the bill, but he paid the next week's bill. And he said, and if you need more, I'll give it to you. That kind of sacrificial love for family, that we can be assured that justice will, will roll down for everybody like a mighty wind that we can be assured that his will in heaven is being done here on earth, that we have no greater love than to lay down the lives for our family. <laughs> Whoa, you say that's asking a whole lot, asking way too much. So you mean I can't just fight for others as long as it makes me feel comfortable? You mean I have to cry injustice when God says it's unjust? You mean I have to be concerned for the least of these and those in prison? And ooh, you mean I have to not follow the crowds and follow Jesus? Does that mean I have to acknowledge that those people who name the name of Christ are now my family and I have to fellowship with them and bear their burdens? Does that mean that when I see prejudice and mistreatment happen to my family who don't look like me, I have to do something? I have a girlfriend whose name is Brenda Salter McNear, and she was speaking at a conference last year, and I've known Brenda quite a few years, and I've watched her turn from a speaker to a preacher. And she said that at the beginning of the issues that were happening down in Missouri, she and a group of Christian leaders got together and went down because they wanted to talk to these young black kids and tell them to control themselves and, and to, to understand that they need Christ to help them through this journey. And so they did that and they left. Well, they came back a year later to see what was going on. And while they were there, an incident happened with a policeman and another incident happened with a young person. 
and they were all set to go to get on the plane and they had packed their suitcases and the kids said to them, what you gonna do? It's nothing like having your kid watch you proclaim who Jesus is, but watch you do something else. And finally, some of them got on the plane, but Brenda said, I took my bags off and came back and sat and listened to the dialogue amongst the policemen, amongst the community, amongst the government, because if we were elders and we were gonna tell them what to do, we had to model that behavior in the family. This, folks, is practice. So the answer to all those questions is a big whopping yes. And for me personally, and some of you who've experienced this as women or people of color, or even just the prejudice of being in a different place, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of people telling me, well, you just don't fit here. I'm tired of people saying, when I know I've been mistreated, you're just imagining things. I think I'm pretty smart. I'm not imagining nothing. I know when you're mistreating me. You know when someone's, everybody's been mistreated at some point, but to be constantly questioned into your 60s that you must be imagining things is a tiresome thing. And the other day, as we prepared for tonight, tonight in Chicago, if you remember Pastor Charlie Dates, we are doing something called Pray Chicago at Progressive Baptist Church right by the I don't know, it's White Sox Park to me, it'll always be that. There's a church right next to it. 36 pastors and their congregations and anybody else who wants to come, we've been doing this for four years. And yeah, we think our prayers are changing the city, but sometimes when you see the violence here and out there, it doesn't feel like it. But the one thing that's happening is it's changing us. We're starting to hang out with each other, eat in each other's restaurants, go to each other's houses, take care of each other's children, pray. We learn, we're starting to get intimate with each other in terms of relationship and what can we pray for. And you know what? That relationship has transformed us. So now when we pray, we pray as a whole unit. We pray as the people of God. We pray as family because we spent time together. The same time I was at the radio station, two of my brothers who are white were on this side and my brother Roy and myself were on the other side and we were talking about this event that's gonna happen, but we also, they also said to us they didn't understand what we were feeling, how we were feeling about our sons and daughters until they started hanging with us and they would watch what happened. We'd go to a restaurant, I'd make the reservation. I'd walk in first, they'd look past me. The check went to somebody else and I said, okay, y'all wanna pay it, pay it. I'm good, I'm good with that. The conversations get directed around you. And they said, until we started hanging with you, we thought you all were just whining and complaining about everything. And then we started doing the same thing with our Hispanic brothers and sisters, the stuff that, that they go through. We started having the conversations and spending time with you. And guess what? You can't bust us up if you tried. Because we've become vulnerable. We've talked about the hard things. It's painful. We cry a lot together, but we've become family. And that's just what Reverend King was saying to his brothers and sisters in that letter, which is why he was there in the first place. You ought to be here with me. We serve the same God. His blood runs through our vein. The word of God tells us that. There is no option for you not to feel pain when I feel pain, or I feel pain when you feel pain. And he says to them, I am in Birmingham because there is injustice here. I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. So I can't sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So here's my challenge to you. How do we sit by and not be concerned of what happens in the Roosevelt Road area, six miles from us? Every single thing that folks came to the suburbs for is now out here. The heroin hotline is going through here. All kinds of things are happening because the church abdicates its responsibility. It left the city. I get it when other people do that, but I don't get it when the family splits up. 
And that's what happened. And that's what is happening. So here's his challenge to us and my challenge to us at Christ Church of Oak Brook. We're here on the corner of 31st and York Road because believe it or not, injustice is less than six miles away. I don't know if you're watching the news in your own community, but a young man was killed right in the area where we're gonna be doing ministry. We have a city that most of us have had relatives come from. We've moved out here. There's injustice. There ought to at least be a regular prayer meeting going on. Justice there is justice here. And injustice anywhere is not what God has called us to. We could, but we shouldn't sit idly by an Oak Brook this is what Martin Luther King says, and not be concerned about what happens in unincorporated Oak Brook Terrace in Chicago, because injustice there is a threat to justice where? Everywhere. That's what happened those years ago. I know I lived in that community that was tightly integrated for 10 years. It was so much fun. It was what the kingdom would have looked like had we not been scared and pushed out. So. Yes, let's just sit and review with gratitude the past and begin anew, that first hopeful message we heard. And yes, let's rejoice in the revelation of Christ and what he's done for us and what he is doing in us and through us because he's revealed himself to us. But it's more than that. That battle cry that I sang coming up here, that's an intentional battle cry calling us to do something not just here, in our workplaces, in the grocery store. I don't know about you, but I see a whole lot of stuff that happens. And as I grow older, I become a little less fearful. Fear of all places doesn't belong in the body of Christ. Fear stops us from standing up at the workplace when you know Regina did the work and you're getting credit for it. Fear stops us from when those water cooler conversations happen about, well, you know those people, that's just how they are. And it's not just black and white. It's other cultures. Fear of losing our jobs keep us sometimes from speaking truth to power. I know I've done it, and I kept my job. <laughs> because Jesus has called us, the church, to be the church in America. People keep saying, what's wrong with the country? What's wrong with the city? What's wrong with us? We have Jesus, guys. Do you understand who lives in you? When I start to think about that, I shudder. Because so what? If our lives get taken, that's what Cain knew he, what happened to him eventually. I'm going to be with Jesus, wherever that is. I'm good. We should feel the same way, so strongly about doing justice as the body of Christ, which is why we're doing this whole Roosevelt Road initiative, not because we want to serve those poor people, because we need to be transformed. And that's what will happen. We will become family. We'll, come like, we'll become like those 36 pastors in us. We'll get closer because we're willing to walk with each other. Dr. King was only speaking back to his brothers what they should have already known that God expected of them that God had prepared them as ministers of the gospel to do the same work tirelessly and without fear, without apology. But their clannishness and their fear caused them to retreat. Now, I'm not just talking to, to, to white people. Let me say this to you. I don't want you to, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty because everybody's got a clan and everybody can be clannish. So I'm not trying to relieve you of anything. I'm just speaking the truth to us because it's us that don't work together, don't act as family. Let that not be the case for us when we plainly see evil and injustice. Remember our earlier verses for we are who's? God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works and which God has prepared for us in advance to do. Now let's go back to the story of my sister. We prepared for her to come. We had a baby shower, we fixed up half of my room. <laughs> we bought bottles. In those days we made carnation formula, so I learned how to do that and let the bottles cool and all that stuff. And I just thought I was, you know, we prepared for her. 
so that she would live a comfortable life, so that she would feel no pain, so that she would be free of the troubles of the world until she got old enough to really realize what they were. And that's how God prepared for us. The day you and I stepped into the kingdom, the day you and I trusted Jesus and he trusted us to carry his message, we became family. And he's prepared a work for us to do. It might not be the same as my work. You know, a lot of times I get told, well, you just don't do stuff like everybody else does. Right. I am different, but I'm not deficient. And if everybody was the same, some of us would be unnecessary. So I am necessary to the body of Christ. You are necessary to the body. You are important to it. I don't care what church you go to, where you go to, who says it. You have been given a work to do before the foundations of the earth, and he expects you to walk in it. And then he goes on to say, now, while you're doing it, give yourselves fully to it, not looking to the left or right for somebody's approval or sanction of others. Like someone said to me, I just really, really do that. I'm thinking to myself, I'm really not concerned with your approval because this is my marching orders. Now, I wasn't rude. I kept my mouth shut. But if, like some of my friends know, if you look in my eyes, it says, give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, not looking to the left or the right, but let nothing move you in your convictions, knowing that your actions count because God says they do. So when you're at work, and even to our young people, when you're at school, when you see injustice happening, and that's when the bullying begins sometimes, that's when the back talk happens. That's when the stuff goes on and it carries on into our adulthood. Say something. Nothing cuts a good argument like Jesus said. <laughs> It'll stop it. I guarantee it will, even at home. <laughs> it works. For God says we should be doing good things and not worrying. The time for doing justice the time for speaking truth, the time for re-engaging in the redemptive work of the church is now. These actions, I hope, will enable Christ's church to be hope in an otherwise hopeless world. Let's be the church, knowing that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment, the garments of Jesus Christ, to destiny, together. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And that's why, my brothers and sisters, we can't wait.